This morning we are in Revelation chapter 2. We're continuing on in this section that is called the seven letters to the seven churches. And so let's open our Bibles up to Revelation chapter 2 verse 8. That's where we're at. Revelation 2 verses 8 through 11. Let me read to you, then we'll have a word of prayer. And to the church of the and to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write. These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much uh, for your presence here with us, Lord. Thank you that you love us. Truly you do. Thank you that you know us. You know what we need. You know what's best for us. You know the things that, that perhaps need to be removed from our lives. Things need to be turned away from. We commit this church to you, Lord. We commit our families, our marriages, our friendships. Commit our own hearts to you, our minds, our desires, Lord. Uh, we pray you bless this time. We pray you bless your body all over the world, Father. Uh, many have met today already, some in secret. Some may have been arrested today already for meeting in places where it's illegal. Um, bless your suffering saints, Lord. And uh, we commit our lives to you. We commit this time to you. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this morning we talk about suffering as a Christian. In Revelation chapter 1, Jesus, excuse me, John has a, a vision of Jesus. And he sees him exalted and glorious. And we it's all kind of a prophetic vision. It's a otherworldly vision of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is seen as being in the midst of his churches. So chapter 1 is an introduction to Jesus, and Jesus gives his credentials, if you will, and explains to John who he is and what he does. John knew Jesus, of course, when Jesus was in his incarnation, but now he sees the risen Jesus. He sees Jesus kind of the back-to-normal Jesus. <laughs> Jesus on earth was the exception. Jesus in Revelation is back to how he usually is. In chapters 2 and 3, we see seven letters that are written to seven different churches that, that existed in that day. Last week, we read the first letter. It was to the church at Ephesus, and they were the church that had left their first love. They had good theology. They had good doctrine. They resisted false teachers, all of those things, which was outstanding. But they lost their love for Christ. Their hearts have grown cold. So we talked about how that can happen. We can have right doctrine. We can vote biblically. We can work our jobs. We can love our families, pay our taxes, all those things. We can resist those who would try to indoctrinate us with falsehood. But we can't lose our love for Christ. And so Jesus told them to repent and return to their first love. In this section here, in verses 8 through 11, we see a church that's suffering. It's the church at Smyrna. And uh, obviously, Christians suffer to this day. There's, there's different ideas about how many Christians actually are martyred each day, still. But, you know, some people may think that um, the first century, second century, third century, under Roman government and all that, under the Roman Empire, more Christians were killed but it's actually been, been guesstimated that more are killed in these days than in those days. It's, it's illegal to me as a Christian. Uh, it's a, church, Christian churches are illegal in a lot of countries. Many times you don't know where the church is meeting until that morning. Because the authorities 
You know, and they'll send people into the churches to infiltrate them, to find out when they're meeting, they're ready to arrest the pastors and other church leaders. And so probably Christians got arrested today, some were in prison today, some may have been killed today. So we are tremendously privileged to worship, to be able to worship freely here. Don't ever forget that. And the body of Christ uh, really, we really put forth a great effort in many parts of the world uh, to gather together corporately. And so, uh, you know, sometimes we are, sometimes we don't want to drive across town, you know. They risk their lives. I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad, it's just the truth, you know. And if it's, if it's a little bit of a poke in the ribs to provoke you to godliness, well, you guys are here, so you made it. Uh, anybody watching online? You know, so, uh, I'm teasing, gently, gently teasing and gently exhorting. But here, the church at Smyrna, it was a first century church. It was a real place, a real time, real people going through real problems. When we study the seven letters to the seven churches, we want to consider how Jesus talks to them. And Jesus speaks to them in a way that they need to understand, in a way that they need to hear from him. He knows what's going on. We see that in, we saw that in, in Revelation chapter 1, that he stands in the, in the midst of his churches, and he holds the angels of the church in his hand, which are thought to be either angelic messengers or, or the pastors of the church. And so he's, he's totally aware of, of the struggles of his people. Let's look at the notes here, if we could. Uh, just we want to get some we want to get some history on the church and so it's important for us to understand that Jesus understands so let's just read through the notes Smyrna one of the great cities of Asia it competed with Ephesus for prominence and culture and in business and in wealth it was destroyed in 580 BC but rebuilt in 290 BC it was known for its beauty so destroyed but it came back. It was one of the first cities to incorporate emperor worship. Citizens had to appear before the emperor once a year and offer a pinch of incense on a burning coal and proclaim Caesar as Lord. And the Christians would not do this and were persecuted for it. So Rome considered the emperors divine. And so to be a citizen of Rome, you also had to be a worshiper of, of the emperor. And so that's why you see so many times in the New Testament that says Jesus is Lord, not, not Caesar. Jesus is Lord. And the Christians wouldn't do this. And so the properties would be confiscated. They'd be imprisoned. They would be tortured. They would be killed. And they were considered rebels against the state. They were considered uh, a group of rebellious people wanting to take down uh, the empire. The topic of death and eternal rewards is found often throughout these just these four verses. Smyrna, the name of the city, comes from the word myrrh, which is a sweet-smelling perfume used to care for dead bodies. It's a gummy resin, resin, notice, that releases its aroma when heated or put under pressure. So you could have a kind of a gummy resin here. I could just be holding it. It's kind of hard. It's It just doesn't look like much. It's just, you know, kind of opaque, kind of clear and all of that. But if you heat it up, or if you begin to, to uh, put it under pressure, it releases the fragrance. And that's an idea of, sometimes our best testimony is when we're going through suffering, when we're going through the fire, when you're under pressure. Just like Smyrna, just like myrrh, um, when it's under pressure or in the fire, it releases an aroma, a fragrance. And this is what is beautiful about the church at Smyrna. They were under pressure. They were going through the fire. But that caused them to cling to Christ more tightly and to release the fragrance of Christ. So, the fragrance of Christ, that's kind of a poetic way of saying that you sense that Jesus is there. Paul used that, that language in the, uh, when he wrote to the Corinthians. He says, to some we are the fragrance of death, but to the others the, the, the fragrance of life. So, Jesus here is addressing them. And notice, Smyrna had been a city that died and was revived. Jesus was dead and came back to life. So he's going to speak to them in those terms. He knows what it's like to exist, to not exist, and then to exist again. 
So he's speaking to them in those terms. The resurrection of Jesus was especially important to these Christians who were heavily persecuted, some of them being killed. Death could not defeat Jesus or his people. And so he's using these phrases because that's what they were facing. He doesn't come to them and say, oh, I'm going to create a way for you to have hot water so you can bathe in. He doesn't come to them, I'm going to help you pay your taxes. He doesn't come to them and say, you know, we're going to, we're going to create some gardens because people are undernourished. He doesn't talk about any of those things. He says, I was the one who was dead and came back to life. And I know that you, some of you are being killed. He talks to them in a way that they need to hear. He understands what's going on with them. He speaks to them directly, directly to the problem because he sees the problem. He knows the problem. He describes himself as the first and the last. We've discussed this before. This is a name given to God, Yahweh, in the Old Testament, uh, found in Isaiah 41, Isaiah 44, Isaiah 48. The first and the last is what the God of the Old Testament calls himself, Yahweh. I am the first, I am the last. And here Jesus is calling himself the first and the last. Look at verse 8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? These things says the first and the last. Jesus Christ, who was dead and came to life, Jesus Christ. So he says, just like Smyrna was alive and then it was destroyed, it was dead and then it came to life again. I'm the one who was dead and came to life. And by the way, my title is first and last. And by the way, yes, I am divine. Amen. Yes, I am God the Son. And I've been encouraging you guys. Guys, I hope you have one page in your Bible where you write. It's just like a cheat sheet, you know. If you were taking a final exam and the, and the teacher said, you can bring in your notes, one page. I mean, you'd be writing like this big. You'd have a magnifying glass. You'd have, you'd have you know, you'd just have as many notes as you could get. I hope you have a page like that in your Bible. Amen. Because people are going to come and knock on your door. And they're going to tell you about paradise and all these kinds of things. And they're going to de they're going to deny that Jesus is God. Yeah. And then you just take them to Isaiah 41, 44, 48. Who's talking? Well, obviously, uh, God the Father. Uh, Revelation 2, verse 8, who's talking? Oops. Jesus the Son. Therefore, you know, A, A plus B equals C, Jesus is God. Okay? So this is the way that you can share Christ with people. I can't remember all this stuff. In, in my big leather Bible that I often use, I have, I have cheat, cheat, cheat notes all over the place. So I can help share with people. So... So the introduction, look at verse 8, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? This is, this is who's talking, the first and the last, Alpha and the Omega, who was dead and he came to life. And this is what he says in verse 9. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but, but I know, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So their current situation, look at your notes once again. Jesus says, I know. So many times over the years as a pastor, and you guys as Christians too, you, you meet people, how you doing? Oh, it's pretty hard. Oh, well, well God will help you. And sometimes people say, well, you don't understand. How, how many times do we hear that? You don't understand what I'm going through. And, and I have to tell people sometimes, you know what? You're right. I don't understand. I haven't been through what you're going through. I don't understand that. I understand sorrow. I understand pain, but not exactly the way that you're going through it. But Jesus can say, I know. Yeah. He, he went through all of the same trials and temptations that we do maybe not exactly down to the detail but all the human emotions betrayal sorrow a care for loved ones uh being blasphemed being lied about being mischaracterized all of these things being persecuted physically jesus can say i know so if there's any of you guys especially going through a very difficult time right now maybe i can maybe i can't relate and i'll admit it's it's very helpful when when uh, somebody you know is comes and says, oh yeah, I went through that too. There's kind of a fellowship there, isn't there? There's a bond. When somebody has been through what you're going through, and it's a very, very similar story, but we can't do that with, with everybody, but Jesus can. He can say, I know. Look at verse 9 once again. I know. I know what's going on with you. I know your works, tribulation, poverty, all, all of these things. Jesus commended them for doing good in the midst of suffering. Please don't think, dear brothers and sisters, Please don't think, I'll start serving the Lord when the pain goes away. I'll start serving God with my ministry, with my gifts, these things, when this situation gets better. We don't see that happening here with the Church of Smyrna. There's seven letters to seven churches. Only two of them are not criticized by Jesus. Smyrna is one of them. Why? Because in the midst of suffering, they were, doing, they were still serving God. They were still in the race. Maybe limping a little bit, but they were still in the race. 
And so please, may, may you not be fooled by the enemy and by your own fleshly, sinful nature to think that when, the, when this gets better, or when this thing gets resolved, then I can get back to living as a Christian. Then I can get back to serving God. Then I can get back to, 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 to giving to the Lord financially or with my time or talent or whatever else. Please don't think that way. They, these guys were doing it in the midst of hard times. He commended them for the good they were doing in the midst of suffering. Additionally, Jesus saw their suffering and predicted that more was coming and of a more intense nature, and he saw that they were willing to suffer to honor him. I, I want you to, to just look, turn with me over to Psalm 139. This isn't directly connected to Revelation per se, but it shows us, and David writes here in Psalm 139, that God sees and God knows. Please don't, please don't think Please don't think that your situation is so unique that God doesn't understand what you're going through. Please don't think that. Because if you start thinking that, I, I would say you're leaning towards hopelessness. And hopelessness is a very difficult way to live. We're just going to read through this. This is a Psalm of David. David was, was a man who struggled. He was a man who was betrayed. King Saul tried to kill him many times. His own son betrayed him. Other people betrayed him. He sinned himself many times. But this is just a simple psalm, and let's just read through it. David's aware that God understands his life. Lord, you have searched me. You've known me. You know my sitting down. You know my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. There's not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before. You've laid your hand upon me. I don't think in a mean way. I think as a like the, kind of an arm around the shoulder kind of thing. And such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I is high. I cannot attain it. Guys, what, what's going on here? David's slowing down. He's slowing down and just thinking. Well, this is, this is hard, and this is bad, and this is unfair, and I don't see how we're going to get out of this thing. And whatever he's going through, he's slowing down and saying, wait a minute. I need to just stop, and, I, and, and God is with me. He loves me. He knows, he knows all about me. He knows what's going on with me. He's laid his hand upon me. I'm not out of his reach. I'm here. I'm here. He's here. Look at verse 7. Where can I go from your presence? Where can I flee from your presence? Nowhere. If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in, in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. The right hand is the hand of strength in the Old Testament. The hand, the hand that, that holds the sword. Verse 11. Surely... If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Even Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. It doesn't matter what's going on around me. I might feel like I'm in the dark, but God, you're not in the dark. You are light. You see and you understand. You formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully, wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. God, before I was born, you knew about me. Now that I am born, you haven't forgotten about me. And in your book... They were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. And when I am awake, I am still with you. It's just this great sense of confidence that David had that God was with him. Guys, why, why, is, why is Jesus... We can turn back to Revelation. Why is Jesus describing himself that way? 
Because he's just simply saying, I know how you feel. I understand. I was dead too. They killed me, but I came back to life. I, I understand. I know what you're going through. You're not alone. Look at, look at your notes there, Romans 8, 31 and 32. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And maybe a better way to say that is, if God is for us, who can effectively be against us? Yeah. Satan is always against you. Yeah. And people are against you, but they can't effectively be against you. Your situation, your brothers and sisters, your situation, whatever you're going through today, if you're suffering, maybe you're suffering silently. And maybe there's an illness, or maybe there's a financial setback, or a family thing, or un unsaved children, or you know, prodigal children, or grandkids, or marital problems or whatever. You're suffering silently, but God knows and he sees. He has you. None of those things can effectively be against you. Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but he delivered him up for us all, how shall he not, how shall, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God is not going to withhold anything from you that you need. Look at verse 9. He says, I know, I know your works, your tribulation, and your poverty, but you're rich. Their works, the persecution and the unfair suffering, had not stopped them from the good works. I really pray that, um, that hard times won't stop you from serving the Lord. I'm sure a lot of you can share the same kind of story, but Debbie and I have a friend who's a, a lady whose family, it didn't fall apart, it blew up. It exploded. Divorce, family problems, legal matters. And she was not guilty of anything. And she just kept serving the Lord. She's in the front row at church kind of thing, not necessarily the front row, but in spirit in the front row. Just steady, 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 steady. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to say, well, I'll, I'll come back to walking with Jesus when all the pain goes away. Okay. You know, conversely, my wife and I, sadly, and some of you have too, so, sometimes when bad things come, people are just, they depart from the church, they depart from the body of Christ, and they're just, they're gone. It's just like they just, and I'm, no, I'm nobody, and we are nobody to judge people's hearts or motives or, or commitment or level, and I don't know what people are going through, but Jesus knows what they're going, what they're going through. Yes. And, and more than anything, rather than try to you know, speak poorly or kind of condescendingly, and I don't mean to speak condescendingly, many who don't go through struggles well, there are some people that go through struggles very well. And they just don't, they, it's not that they don't cry, it's not that they don't suffer, they, it's not that they don't, there's tears, there's pain, there's sorrow, they're shaking the head. There's all these things. But they just keep going. They just keep serving. Not, not as a way to... It's, and it's not even, I don't think, well, I'm just going to stay busy until the pain goes away. No, I'm... Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm suffering. So it's almost kind of like, yeah, so what? People suffer. People go through things. What am I going to do? Stop until I feel better? No. And Smyrna was that kind of a church. They were just like... Straight ahead, straight ahead, straight ahead. And they're getting persecuted. Jesus said, I know your works. I know, I know your tribulation. Um, Greek word there, thlipsis. It means to press together. It's a burden that crushes. This wasn't like, you know, we say things like, well, it's not in my comfort zone. <laughs> comfort zone isn't in the Bible. I don't know if you know that or not. That phrase is not in the Bible, you know. But this isn't like Paul or John saying, um, "Yeah, it's kind of difficult," or Jesus saying, "Yeah, I know it's a little bit hard." He says, "You're being, you're being, you're in a vice, and, and people are bearing down on you. It's a, it's a pressing together, a burden that crushes." John, the human author, was also experiencing tribulation. He already talked about that on the, on the island of Patmos. Now, the next few thoughts here are kind of crazy to me. Polycarp was a bishop around 152 A.D. He was burned to death there in Smyrna. And as we study here, we're going to see that there was a lot of religious opposition. 
A commentator named Kittle said this, from this letter, this is crazy, I, I, this, is, this is not in my world. From this letter, we can gain some idea of the unbounded fortitude, mental and emotional strength, of these early Christians. John assumes that the people of Smyrna share his own attitude to physical suffering. He speaks lightly of it. He doesn't say in chapter 1, John doesn't describe himself, I'm the radically suffering servant and they tried to kill me and boil me in oil, but God saved me and now I'm off on this terrible rock and it's just like Alcatraz and there's nobody here and I'm alone and so I'm writing this letter to you. He doesn't, he doesn't say that. He just says, yeah, I share in the suffering. It's like commonplace. It's like, on, you know, when we were having the, the fires over the last few years, how bad the, the air quality was? It's like, how's your lungs? Yeah, mine are bad too. I mean, it was just common. Everybody was like, yeah, I can't catch my breath either. It's like, it's like it was the norm. And John here is speaking of it as the norm. Yeah, I have sufferings in the persecution too. It's just, it's just how they live. You want to follow Christ, get ready to suffer. In many places in the world, that's how it is. In Islamic countries, they'll throw acid in your face or they'll kill you or they'll do something to you. Just get ready to suffer. It's just how, that it, it's just how it is. John assumes that the people of Smyrna share his own attitude towards physical suffering. He speaks lightly of it, as one speaks of familiar things. Words so brief spoken to men who might at any time go to their death, they have a, in them a heroism which is even now has its power to stir the blood. It stirs my blood, yeah. thinking about that. Christians that suffer, I don't have to suffer. I might get some snickers. I, there's been a few times I've been made fun of at work when I was doing secular jobs. This or that. Oh, poor me. You know, we did some concerts in the 80s and high schools in Los Angeles. I think I got an apple thrown at me. Oh, no. It was obvious. Like, it, was, it was an apple. You know? I wasn't in danger. We're disapproved of. We're laughed at sometimes. We're mocked. We're belittled. Guys, that's just the tip of the iceberg compared to, I'm not trying to minimize what we go through. I'm just saying it, it, it does get a lot worse in the world. And here Smyrna is the suffering church and they are just saying, we're gonna go forward. Yes, it's hard. Yes, life is hard. We're gonna go forward. And Jesus says, I know you're going forward. Well done. It's just an exhortation. It's just a, they're just a wonderful example to us, aren't they? They're just a wonderful example. Jesus says, I know your poverty, and it's not just poor, it's like beggarly or having nothing. Christianity was illegal at the time, and Christians were an easy target for plunder. In Hebrews 10, we read this. Recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. He's talking... The writer's talking to, to Jewish Christians who had gone through some persecution in the first century. He says in Hebrews 10.33, partly while you were made a spectacle by both reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains. This is just out of my world. I haven't had to go through this. Joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. So this first century Christian, it's just, just statements. Again, not, we're not less than they are because we're not suffering like, like they did. We're not less. But it's just the hope would be that if it happens to us, we wouldn't fall away. That's the, that's the hope. I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. You're not a better Christian if you're suffering. I don't particularly enjoy suffering. You know, I, I don't go to the opera. <laughs> Love you there, you know. But I, I don't go looking for suffering. But, but if something happens, I want to go through it well. And there's just a bunch of examples in, 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 the, in the Bible and in church history. Fox's Book of Martyrs, a, a more modern day book by a, the band DC Talk called Jesus Freaks. Get it. It's available on Amazon now. It's probably used. You can get it for five or six bucks. Buy that book and be amazed about modern day suffering under communism, under Russian communism in Eastern Europe, under Chinese oppression, under in Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, places where Christians still suffer. It's very encouraging stories of brothers and sisters that just say, I'm not gonna quit. I'm just not gonna quit. And the comfort for them is 
that they know that Jesus sees and he knows. And he can relate to them. He says to them, you are rich. Though they were poverty stricken, they were spiritually rich. There's a great contrast between world riches and spiritual riches. Worldly riches can be lost. Spiritual riches can never be taken away. Worldly riches can never satisfy the soul, but spiritual riches can. Turn the page if you would. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, Hell and destruction are never full. The eyes of man are never satisfied. The natural man, the natural woman, has a propensity and has an inclination to just want things, to just want more and more and more, thinking that somehow things or relationships or places or possessions or uh, position or you know recognition or those things are going to satisfy the soul, and they just don't. You read about that in Ecclesiastes. Solomon had, you know, how many wives? 700 wives, 300 concubines? Wasn't satisfied. Unlimited riches, unlimited power. He just said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just be, I'm going to play the fool and I'm going to do everything and look for gratification and he found them. These people here, guys, look at, look at verse 9 again and just kind of file these things in your head. I know your works. I know that you're working hard. I know your tribulation. I know that you're like in a vice being squeezed. And I know your poverty, but you are rich. So every, every way that the world looked at Smyrna, Jesus looked at them completely opposite. And then he uh, talks about this thing in verse 9. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Back to the notes. Smyrna had the largest Jewish population of any Asian city. Many of the first century Jewish leaders were extremely religious in, in a self-righteous kind of way, but they had no true love for God or his son, Jesus Christ. And so there was a religious persecution. Religious persecution from the empire of Rome who said you need to say Caesar is Lord and they wouldn't. And then the religious persecution uh, from, the, from the, the carnal, really unsaved Jewish people. Look at, look at the notes there, John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. So they were getting it from all sides. They were getting it from Rome. They were getting it from the, the religious Jews who are not born again. They were getting persecuted from all sides. Jesus says, I, I know. Look at verse 9 again. I know. And then he says again, and I know. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Revelation 12.10, Satan is called the accuser of the brethren, and these people were being accused all the time. That's one of the hardest things for me. I don't know about you guys. You know, if I do something dumb, when I do something dumb, <laughs> And you call me on it, there's, there's kind of no defense. You know, I, I said the stupid thing, I forgot, I, I promised you I would help you with something and I forgot. Or, you know, I, I failed, it was, it was an action, it was a word, um, it was obvious, and so you can call me on it. But when, but when people make things up, that drives me crazy. You can't, you can't defend yourself against people that make things up. I might do something stupid, say something stupid, and I'll kind of try real hard to kick myself in the rear for a while until my leg gets tired and punish myself, and then it's done, you know. But but when somebody's accusing you and making and making things up, that just tears me up. I don't know about you guys. Does that bother anybody else like crazy? That drives me crazy. And they tell me what my intentions were. You said this, but you really meant that. Are you come on? You know, there's better things to do. You know, that just drives me crazy. And that kind of stuff can eat away at you. And this is what they were going through. And not just the accusations, guys, but don't, don't forget the tribulation and the poverty. What was it like for, for a Christian man in that day to have worked hard for years and finally can buy a home and, 
He's raising a family, and some people come and just take it all away. Now they have to find a place to live. It's just, that's what they were going through. It was a very, very difficult time and place to live in and follow Jesus. Look at verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Jesus is, uh, Jesus is not encouraging them. I'm going to get just a tiny, tiny, so I'm going to give you some sanctified sarcasm here. <laughs> but I mean, one of, the, one of the verses that we love to use in the Christian, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Right there. <laughs> right? Yep. That was a promise to the nation of Israel as they were returning from Babylon going back to Jerusalem. They were in Babylon because they were carnal, idol-worshipping people. And God says, okay, you've suffered enough, now I'm going to bring you back to Jerusalem, you're going to rebuild Jerusalem. And on your way, no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. Here Jesus is saying, they're going to, the weapons formed against you are going to prosper. So, I, I, and again, forgive me, I, I don't mean to be kind of like sarcastically, reverentially sarcastic or whatever the phrase was, whatever adjectives I use to describe my activities, but Christians are going to suffer. We, we can't take these verses and just use them like a Hallmark card and and slap somebody on there. You're going through a hard time. Oh, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Where's the donuts? You know, you just, you can't, you can't just throw those cliche things around like that. Christians die today. Christians suffer. Nobody can take away their salvation. Nobody can take away their eternal life, but they, they, can, they can end their life. Jesus said, don't fear those who can kill the body. He didn't say, don't fear those because they'll never kill the body. He said, don't fear those who can kill the body because they can kill the body, but they can't take away your soul. He's, set, he's setting their view high. Look at verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. You will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death. I'll give you the crown of life. Jesus guaranteed that they were going to suffer. But what's the exhortation? Don't be afraid. Luke chapter 12, verse 47. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body after that have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins, or, and not one of them is forgotten by God? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. It's just eternal perspective. There's been times that I've been afraid. I've been in, in foreign countries sometimes where I've been afraid. I've been with, with in Eastern Europe, in Serbia one year, walking through the town square with the pastor and he says, bro, don't speak English. <laughs> don't speak English. Not in public. I was afraid a little bit, you know. To feel the fear isn't the problem. To give in to the fear is the problem. Right. To let the fear rule you is the problem. Yeah. And Jesus is saying here, don't be afraid. I want you to endure. And I think those two things go together. Don't, don't, be, don't be afraid so that you don't endure. Don't be afraid so that it causes you to quit. Feel the fear, but let, let, let your faith have the triumph over the fear. This is the quote by Steve Gregg. Look, fearlessness, he says, however, may not necessarily mean the total absence of dread, but rather the refusal to succumb to intimidation so that the threats of harm do not turn them back from their duty to Christ. That, that, was, that was the church of Smyrna. You know, you see your neighbor lose their house and get arrested. You think you're next. Why husband and wife start talking? It's just a pinch of incense. God will forgive me. I mean, you know. No, we're not going to do that. They were just, they were dedicated. Augustine said this, God had one son on earth without sin, but never one without suffering. Yeah. Wow. We're just going to go through things. It's just, it's just part of, just part of the life. The great encouragement is here that Jesus knows and he sees. 
and he stands in the midst of his church. That's why he has a wonderful, glorious description of himself in chapter 1. The exhortation from Jesus was to be faithful unto death. It wasn't to not experience emotional fear. In other words, don't be frightened into turning away from Jesus. Amen. Don't be frightened into turning away. Yes. We can't help our emotions, you know. We can't. We feel things. We fear things. But how freeing it is to say, you know, that when we're fearing things, we're fearing that we're... We're, we're afraid of something that hasn't happened yet. Right? Yeah. Debbie, what's that thing that you tell the ladies sometimes about Philippians? I'm throwing you in the deep end of the pool here. Um, oh, let, set your mind on whatever is true. Yes. You remember those verses? Can you quote them? Anybody remember that verse? No. Yeah. Jim, you got it? I can't quote it. No. Okay, let's, let's turn to Philippians chapter 4. This is off, off the script here. Yeah, Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, just, pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's any praiseworthy, meditate on those things. But notice the first thing that he says. Whatever is true... Fear isn't true yet because it hasn't happened. I mean, you might be fearful about something, but you're being fearful about something that hasn't happened. You're letting something that doesn't exist control you. Yeah. Is there a possibility that it might happen? Yeah, there is, but there's also a possibility that it might not. So we're letting ourselves be controlled by something that doesn't exist. Does that make sense? Yes. Tell me yes. yes. Okay. Are you, in, are you in Philippians 4 with me? Yes. Look at Whatever is true, noble, just, pure, lovely, good report, any virtue, any praiseworthy, meditate on those things. What, what's easy to happen when we're getting persecuted? We're, medi we're, we're focusing on the fear. Yes. We're focusing on the fear. Notice verse 9. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. What are you yeah. going to think about? The whole, guys, so much of you can turn back to Revelation. So much of our Christian life is taking these thoughts captive taking these thoughts captive. Well, what if, what if I don't, you know, do a pinch of incense to Caesar? What are they going to do to us? I don't know. Maybe nothing. Maybe kill us. Who knows? I don't know. We, we're we're going to go to heaven one way or the other. We're going to be with Jesus one way or the other. I want to serve him. I don't want to deny him. And I know that he's with me. Psalm 139. There's nowhere I can flee from his presence. He's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. <clears throat> Look at verse 10 again. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Jesus is predicting they're going to suffer more. Indeed, who's, who's going to do it? The devil. He's about to throw some of you into prison. Satan was behind the hatred and the active persecution of these Christians. And he's behind, he's behind it still. And Jesus said that you may be tested. This is very interesting. Look, here's, here's a definition of that phrase that you may be tested. To test something to ascertain its quality, whether good or bad. You know, you find, you find a, a clear, you know, let's say your kids are out here playing after church in the dirt out here, and somebody will comes in and they, hey, Mommy, look what I found. And it's a big chunk of clear gem. It's a big, and you're thinking, a diamond, you know. It's like, well, how do you know? You have to get it tested. You get it tested, so, and, you, and the intention of getting it tested is with the hope that it proves to be the real thing, right? Yes. No, let's go get it tested so I can show you that you're wrong. I mean, if you don't do it that way, you get it tested to, to show that it's, that, that it's the real thing, it's the genuine thing. Mm. And this is what Jesus is saying. These guys are going to test you. Look at verse 10. Do not fear any of those things that you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested with the purpose of proving that you're the real thing. Satan wants to test us to disqualify us. Jesus allows us to be tested or test us for the purpose of proving that, we're, that we are the sincere, real followers of him. That's what the testing does. Look at 1 Peter 1, 7, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire. The genuineness of your faith, how do you know if somebody has genuine faith? Because they go through what? They go through the fire. 
that lady that I was describing to you a little while ago, her faith was just exploding. She had such a radical testimony, not because she was verbalizing it, just because she was there. Are you guys with me? Yeah. She was just like, I'm going to keep following Jesus. And people are Amen. going, man, I would have quit. Right. Going through what you're going through, I would have quit. She said, I'm not going to quit. And her faith was tested by fire, and it was just beamingly bright. Look at 1 Peter 1, 7 again. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, it perishes. Though it's tested by fire, be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The friend that Debbie and I have, what are we doing? We're talking about her faith right now. This happened 10, 15 years ago, something like that. I'm still using her as an example. And saying, this is what Jesus can do for you too. Sadly, uh, sadly, we have other friends that it's just like, I'm not saying they're not saved, but I'm just saying, what happened? You just kind of threw up your hands and went to the back of the cave and we haven't seen you and what happened, you know? And, 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 and maybe the good things are happening and I pray that they are, but, but I don't know. There's no, there's no evidence of, of people that are pushing through sometimes. Guys, we're frail and we're weak. I mean, it says in the Psalms that, that God knows we are just dust, you know? We are just dust. How wonderful when we are filled with the Holy Spirit and, and can just push through these things. So the implication here, look at your notes. The implication is that they would pass the test. The persecutions would prove how committed they were, that their hearts were for God. Satan wants to test us to get us to fail, to prove that we aren't true in our faith. Consider the Christian that fails, <clears throat> quote unquote, okay, in, in parentheses there, quotation marks. We look at ourselves and hate what we have done or didn't do. We have deep regrets that we failed, okay, been there, done that. We don't need to raise our hands on that, do we? <laughs> Yet even in our regrets, guys, when you fail, even in your regrets, what does it do? It proves that you're the real thing. Are you with me? I will ask for hands. How many of you have failed as Christians? How many of you were sad about it or angry about it? What does that prove? That you have godly intentions that you're in Christ. God uses it all for his good. If you were a Christian, quote unquote Christian, that failed and just said, oh well, chuck it up, doesn't matter. I, I would question maybe your salvation a little bit. But even when we fail and have regrets over it, it's proof of who we are. Even in our regrets, our faith is proven. Unbelievers don't grieve over moments of failure the way that Christians do. They might grieve over the, over the consequences, but they don't grieve over the fact that, Lord, I failed you. And the grieving Christian is, is, is a verification that the person is a Christian. God uses our failures to prove who we are. It's amazing. So, let's finish up here. Verse 10, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison <clears throat> that you may be tested and you will be and you will have tribulation 10 days. Various ideas on this. Now, one, one of our uh, one of our mantras in studying uh, the book of the Revelation is keep the main thing, the main thing. What does 10 days mean? I have no idea. No idea. Various ideas on this. Ten waves of persecution lasting into the fourth century. That is verifiable historically. Rome had ten waves of persecution against them. It might be ten years, ten days. What do we know for sure? We know for sure it was going to happen. And we also know for sure that it was going to be a measured time and not eternal. So the suffering is measured. It's not eternal. And Jesus said this. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Jesus reminded them that he had been faithful unto death. Look at chapter 2, verse 8. These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. How was it that he was dead? Because he was faithful. Because he didn't run from the cross. And Jesus said, I will give you the crown of life. Jesus did not promise that he will protect his people from martyrdom, but that if they remain faithful unto death, they shall receive the crown of life. The second death that he talks about in verse 11, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. I believe that's the great white throne judgment where somebody is judged as not being saved, as, as one who had never given their lives to Christ. Cool. 
if you're going through through a special kind of suffering right now, you know, I, I may be able to put my arm around you, and I may be able to pray for you, and I may be able to commiserate with you, and 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 maybe I've gone what you've gone, I've gone through what you're going through, and maybe I can maybe I can say I understand, maybe I, I maybe I can't say I understand, but Jesus understands. Jesus understands. It says in the book of the Hebrews, of Hebrews, that, that Jesus the Son cried out to the Father with vehement cries in which he was heard, but that he had to suffer to become the perfect uh, great sacrifice, the perfect great high priest for our sins. Jesus, Jesus went through, guys, I believe, not every single kind of temptation, but every, every temptation of the human soul, everything that you feel, Betrayal, once again, slander, lies against you, confiscation, being misunderstood, being accused, all these things, physical assault, all the, all the human experience that we go through, Jesus went through all of it. It may have looked a little bit different, but the result on the soul was the same, and he understands, and he sees. And the Bible tells us to rise above it, and to set our eyes on heaven. Set your affection on, on things above where Christ is. So I pray, I pray that you're encouraged today, and I pray that you can rally yourself. And when those things come, that you can take every thought captive that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. Every threat that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. All those things, guys, want to want. Satan wants you to get your eyes off of, off of Jesus and onto yourself and, and, and onto, the, onto potential consequences that may or may not ever happen. He wants to get you away from Jesus. But this is a word here, be faithful unto the end. And, and I will say this too. Uh, as you are crushed, and some of you have already gone through crushings. There's a pastor up in Oregon, John Corson, he says, when we go through tests, it, give us, it gives us testimonies. Yes. Some of you can tell us stories, beautiful testimonies of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ because you went through it. You went through it and you came out the other side and you can speak to us of God's faithfulness. And you can encourage us with God's faithfulness. So if you're going through it, just keep going through it. Set your eyes on Jesus. And if you've never said yes to Jesus, we just so want to encourage you and invite you to say yes to Jesus Christ. For the forgiveness of your sins, for the comfort and, and that he brings, for his presence in our lives. Let me pray for us. Lord, you're a good God. And we thank you. And we thank you, Lord, that you understand that you weren't, uh, Jesus, you didn't stay up in heaven and just shout down to us. You came and walked among us. Thank you for that, Lord. Father, I pray for, uh, we pray, Lord, for those who are suffering today, that you, uh, you lift their heads. Your word says you're the lifter of our heads. And uh, Lord, that um, pray that people would make a renewed effort to read your word, to receive from you, to be in prayer, to not allow fear to control them. Pray that they would find great freedom in you. Lord, I pray that as we go through the crushing, as we go through the fire, that the, the beautiful fragrance, the aroma of Jesus Christ would, would come out of our lives, Lord. That everywhere we go, there would be a sweetness about us because we've, we've been poured out. We've been emptied out. Pray for this church, Father, that you bless Calvary Chapel Vallejo for your glory, Lord. Use this place, use every family, use every person. And Lord, as we go through tests, we pray that you would Give us wonderful testimonies, Lord, that would uh, bring you glory and bring you honor, God. So thank you, Lord, so much. We love you, Jesus. We thank you that you went through it all for us. We want to go through it for you. Thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Are there any questions for us today? Can you name some of the countries that don't allow churches in their country?
think a lot of the Middle Eastern countries, um, China for sure, huge, huge uh, persecution against Christians in China. Jim, do you? Iran. Iran? North yeah. Korea. Barbie? North Korea. North Korea. Yeah. Northern Vietnam. Northern Vietnam. You know, um, by the way, you know, sometimes we read these things on social media about the decline of Christianity. It's just not the truth. Christianity is exploding all over the world. Not in, Amer not in America, but all over the world it's exploding. So don't, don't believe those social media lies. There's people coming to Christ like crazy all over the world. So don't believe those lies. So, I mean, you could probably go home and Google, but those are just some of the... Some of the countries that we can think of off of the top of our heads. How about prosperity preachers who say there's no suffering? Are they false teachers? They're teaching false things. That's they're not reading their Bibles. Yeah. Yeah, Christians suffer. The the prosperity gospel wouldn't work in North Korea. It wouldn't work in Iran. You know, if it's the gospel, the gospel works anywhere. Amen. The gospel is true everywhere. Right. So, yeah. Is having illness or sickness considered as persecution? No, I wouldn't think so. Persecution is when people do things against you. Um, I do believe that illness or sickness can maybe be the loving, disciplining hand of the father to a wayward child. Um, I think sometimes the father will allow a child maybe who's hurting himself to go ahead and suffer through things so that they can repent. God, you know, it says in Hebrews 12, 6, whom the Lord loves, he chases and scourges everyone that he calls a son or a daughter. So, I mean, I felt that. And sometimes it's a scourging of the soul, not just of the physical body. There's a dryness, there's an emptiness, there's a leanness in the soul because he allows us to wander and get so sick and tired of being sick and tired that we come back to him. But I don't think that... Uh, I don't think illness or, or sickness is persecution. I do think Satan can attack our bodies and cause us to have some illnesses. Um, we see that in the book of Job, don't we? So I think some, some illnesses might be spiritual, uh, but, but we don't know. It's hard, it's hard to figure those things out sometimes. Whether, the, whether an illness is spiritual or just simply physical or organic, we still need to have the same faith, don't we? Yes. So we just want to hang on no matter what. So, any other questions? Yeah. Guys, let's stand together. Oh, another question. To announce. Oh, oh, thank you, Danny. That's what you were saying. I'm sorry. Yeah, I misunderstood, John. Uh, our board of directors met the other day, and we were we were talking about uh, this church gathering funds to send to Ukraine. Amen. And so, um, I have a nonprofit ministry, and I've I've already donated some funds with the nonprofit ministry. It's 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 the it's the fund that I it's called Build Up the Church. You can find it online. But um, funds have been used for COVID and other things like that, and also to fund uh, the travel that I do when I teach in other countries. But the board was thinking that if you wanted to give kind of above what you normally give here at the church, I would just put it in the offering box. And um, I, I, I know people, I don't have to go looking for a, a missionary organization to send the money to. I know right to who to send it to because we know them, you know, in Western Ukraine. They're receiving a million and a half people about so far have exited yes. Ukraine going into uh, yes. Poland, uh, yes. Hungary, Moldova. And so these people are running for their lives right now. Yes. And so um, the Christians in Mukachava, that's the people that we know, they're taking people in, housing them, helping them to get on, on their way, giving them clothes, giving them food, giving them money. So if you want to put it in some extra today uh, in the offering box, just put it in an envelope, Mark Ukraine, and 100% of it will go to them. So if you want to do that, that would be great. Thank you, Danny, for that reminder. I appreciate it.